Hey friends, I'm here at Temple Square and I want to tell you about a conversation I just had to encourage you to have conversations of your own. I met a sibling couple that had just done some temple work and I asked them where they were from. They were from California and they were heading through Utah. They had stopped at the temple here, um, I think maybe to see family also. And they're heading up to Idaho. Uh, to go to school. Uh, they have been on their missions and they've been to Brazil and Canada. And uh, so here's the progression. Where are you from? Um, what brings you to Salt Lake City? I, um, I, I, I know that they were LDS because they already had their temple bags. I asked them, um, have you ever been able to talk with an evangelical before about the gospel and they said oh yes that they had talked to many evangelicals on their missions so I asked them where did you go on your mission they said uh, Canada and uh, it was uh, another country I forget um, so I asked them what were some of the most common topics that you spoke about with evangelicals on your mission and they searched and they couldn't think of any. So I asked another question. I asked, what do you think are some of the most significant differences between the Latter-day Saint faith and traditional Christianity or evangelicalism? And they said prophets, and temples, and priesthood. Uh, she did, of, of the sibling pair. And I just listened. And she looked at me and she said, what do you think are some of the most significant differences between the two faiths? Um, and just, just again to, to encourage you to repeat that pattern, um, ask people, uh, have you ever had any conversations before with evangelic, an evangelical about faith or the gospel or doctrine? Um, if so, what did you talk about? What were some of the most important or memorable conversations that you had with born-again Christians growing up or on your mission. Um, another question is, what do you think are some of the most significant differences between the Latter-day Saint faith and the traditional Christian faith? And to let them give topics. And then uh, what happened today was she asked me, what do you think are some of the most significant? And I said, really, the one that outranks them all is the nature of God. Um, and she said, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, we worship God as the one from whom all truth and all beauty and all goodness come from. He is someone who wasn't given what he has. Uh, scripture says no one's ever been God's teacher or his counselor. No one's ever given God a gift that he might be repaid. All things are from him and through him and to him. Um, so we worship this God, this great most high first God. And we have a relationship with him. And that's significant because of who he is. And she, I think her name was Samantha, she was very eager to agree with me. Samantha said, oh, I agree. And there was a kind of sweet spirit about it. This is very common here in Utah. It's, it's a quick eagerness to agree. She says, we believe that too. I agree. So what I said today was, can you understand or can you think of why evangelicals like me or born again Christians like me would infer that that is not a shared belief between us and Latter-day Saints. In other words, um, can you understand why what I just said about God is something that for, for born-again Christians is something we don't think we share in common with Latter-day Saints? And she said, um, no. And the, the, the brother said, yeah, I know. And they both looked at me and I said, have you ever heard of the, of the saying or the couplet, as man is, 
God once was. As God is, man may be. And they both said, yes. You've got a cough that's trying to come out. <coughs> and uh, so we talked a little bit about how for some Latter-day Saints we, that we talk to, for many of them, that implies that there is a previous generation of gods that are, that are above or prior to our God. Uh, it, it entails that we can become gods, that couplet in Mormonism, entails that we can become gods just as all the gods did it before us. That's what Joseph Smith said in the King Fault Discourse. You've got to learn how to be gods the same as all the gods have done before you. So um, this puts God in the position of being in a family tree of cosmic deities or cosmic patriarchs. And there's there's a kind of relational uh, ancestry of grandfather God and heavenly great-grandfather God. So what this means is that our particular God is over us, but he's not over all. And um, back up, when I originally explained to them what I believed about God, I said, when I say that God is the greatest, or the first, or the most high, or the source of everything good, true, and beautiful, it's not like I would say that my wife is the best friend, or the best wife, or the best cook in the whole universe. Because the, 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 the implied qualification there is that she is the best for me. There's a kind of romantic hyperbole to the way we speak with people we love. When I say that God is the most high and the first and the source of everything good and true and beautiful and from him and through him and to him are all things, I don't mean to use myself as the reference point for his greatness. It's not as though I can take the universal, absolute, limitless, no boundary, jurisdiction, comprehensive, infinite comprehensiveness, the all-encompassing scope of God's sovereignty it's not as though I could take that and all of God's attributes and say, for me, as though I was the reference point. God is not uh, downstream in an ancestry of God's. Anyway, fast forward to where we were. The, 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 the male sibling said, um, the brother, <laughs> the brother said that, yeah, we... He said of Mormons, we believe that God is God over us and we are under his dominion. But there are others out there that are under other gods and other dominions. So I think the sister was still sort of, uh, this is interesting, I I don't think when she was being eagerly agreeable with me prior that she was lying to me or being malicious. I don't think she was being thoughtful and I don't think she had connected the dots yet. This is just very common in Utah. So in real time, I, I think this was just beginning to make sense to her. <coughs> and so I, I said, imagine you got on a spaceship and you went out into the cosmos. And let's say, you, you know, you could, go, you could go as far out as other universes if there's a multiverse or whatever, or other dimensions. In the traditional LDS framework, if you go out exploring, you, uh, if you meet someone, you're not guaranteed that everyone you meet is under the jurisdiction of your God. You may meet other creations or organiza organizations, you should say. You can meet other, uh, encounter other planets or galaxies or other people groups or individuals out there that you meet. And in the traditional Christian biblical worldview, everything is guaranteed to be under 
the one true God. But if you go out exploring the cosmos of Mormonism, the, the everything that's out there, so to speak, you may encounter beings or uh, parts of the cosmos, the, the universe, and I'm using that in the most absolute sense of everything, you may meet segments or partitions or locales or spaces that are not under the jurisdiction of our God. You may, you may meet people and you, you would have to say to them in Mormonism, um, if, 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 you were, if it was an asking kind of situation, which God do you worship? What cosmic patriarch are you under? What Superman deity exalted person are you under? What godhead do you serve? What patriarch in the family tree of the gods are you under? In Mormonism, it's not guaranteed that everyone will worship or everyone will be under the god that you have. So it started to make sense to her, and it, would, it already made sense to him pretty quickly, that we worship... A, that, that, that what I'm speaking about is the, the distinction between a God who is over all the parts versus a God who is over just a subsection. And so the, the response I got from the, the brother, the male sibling, the brother, was that one reason why this shouldn't bother us is that the dominion of every God in the cosmos, that the that every exalted God eventually has an infinite um, set of worlds, uh, worlds without number, people without number. And he argued that every God, every, among all the exalted gods, among all the, uh, the people that are exalted as gods, every one of them eventually has an infinite number of worlds, an infinite number of people under them. So he argued that if we went out exploring, we would uh, never... We would, we, it would take an eternity, he said, to uh, exhaust all of God's jurisdiction. So we might as well not pay attention or be aware of the people under different jurisdictions or the people that are under different gods or the creations or the organized dominions under other gods. So I asked him, do you think that the exalted gods remain forever ignorant of the people that are under the jurisdictions of other gods? In other words, if I, I, I looked at him and I said, if you, if you uh, become a god with your wife and you have spirit kids, will your, and, and, I, and I pointed to her and I said, if, you become a god, if your husband becomes sort of a, a, an exalted patriarch and you have spirit kids together, will, turning to the brother, will your spirit kids forever be unaware of, your, of you? And they said, no, 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 no. Right now, it's inexhaustible. Right now, it's unknowable. But someday, when we become exalted gods, he said, that we would be aware of the other people under other jurisdictions of other gods. I said, okay, just to make it clear, someday, when you become an exalted god, you and your spirit children who are exalted will be cognizant of your heavenly family and the other br branch of the family tree and the other jurisdictions under other gods. So, yes. Okay. So, in the Bible, God is great and worship worthy. He is worthy to be praised because there's nothing you can find or conceive of that would not be under him that he didn't create. He is God literally over everything. And any notion in Mormonism that, well, um, our particular deity's jurisdiction and greatness is still beyond our comprehension is sort of an overstatement because it's pretty easy even for Mormons right now to comprehend that there will be other people under the different jurisdictions of other gods. So there's a, there's a kind of a, a tactic where people say, um, uh, well, 
uh, that's just too deep to think about right now. That's just beyond my knowledge, or I don't want to think about that right now. That's, that's really mysterious. Or here's what they say. I don't know everything about that. You're trying to imply that I think I know everything there is to know about what it will be like to become a god or the different plurality of the gods. So says, no, 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 no. I'm, my, my point isn't that I think you think you know everything about comprehensively and exhaustively about what it means to become a god and so forth, but you know enough to know, evidently, by your own worldview, that our particular patriarch, uh, divine patriarch, that our particular uh, heavenly deity, a regional heavenly deity over one section of everything, not over all the parts, but over one part, you know enough to affirm right now that among the exalted gods, there are different jurisdictions with gods over different peoples. And that there are some people out there who are not under the jurisdiction of our God. You don't need to say you're omniscient or that you know everything or that you have to know all the deepest mysteries in Mormon theology to be able to affirm that. So, getting back. I turned to Samantha and I said, uh, well, she said, well, obviously, um, we believe in very different things. And she said, I don't think we're going to convince each other. <coughs> she said she had a very strong testimony and she loved what she believed. And she, she said that she felt like I was trying to get her to not believe what she believes. And so I, I, I looked at Samantha and I said, Samantha, um, let me pay you a compliment. Earlier, when I said that the God we worship is the God over everything, that God is the God over all, and that he's the source of everything good, true, and beautiful, and you can't relativize the everything there. You can't partition that out to one subset of reality and say God's only God over this part, but not over that part. When I said that God is God over all, and that he's the source of everything good, and true, and beautiful, you and you're in your conscience and in your spirit, you were eager to agree. And I say, this is a compliment because you were created by God to worship and to love and to know the God who is behind it all. And even you feel bashful about <coughs> having a deity that is over only one part of the whole. And you want to worship the first of all the gods. Uh, it's, it's not good enough to worship just your tribal, cosmic, regional family deity. You were built to search out and to know and to seek and to love the God above whom there's no gods. That's one reason why you were eager to agree with me. And it was only after talking with your brother. It was only after we expounded how Mormonism relativizes that and lessens that and restricts it to just one part of everything, that God is only God over one branch of the family tree, that this became, that was what, this went in a different direction. So, and this is where it became pretty tough, but I said, uh, because she, she, she said uh, that she did believe that God is God over all, even after we had covered all this. And I said, Samantha, you are, the, I said, again, to compliment you, in your heart, you want to take the language of universality and absoluteness when it comes to God's attributes and his dominion. You want to use the strongest and most universal language possible to describe God. You want to, because you know somewhere in your heart that's the kind of God you ought to worship. But if you're worshiping a God that's only a God over the part and not the whole, if you're worshiping a God that is not um, everything that we say it is, that he's not the first of all, he's not the most high, then it's inappropriate and it's inaccurate for you to use that language. If, as your brother affirmed, that God is only God over part and not the whole, if there are other people there that are not under our God's jurisdiction, then it's inappropriate for you to say that God is the God of all. And she, sa she said she really wanted to end the conversation. So I said, I shook her hand, I shook her brother's hand. And I said, can I just share one more verse with you and let you go? She said, sure. In Isaiah, 
God says in Isaiah 43, verse 10, Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be any after me. And I looked at Smith and I said, That is God's testimony to you. And that was it. I hope that encourages you. <laughs>